Hello, I am happy to be here with Julia Taliesin once again from the Somerville Journal. Uh, we're here to go over some of the, the latest news and things that people are talking about in and around Somerville. Welcome to you, Julia. Thank you so much, Dave. It's good to be back. Yeah, glad to have you. Um, so as is typical with these news roundups, we're going to start off with uh, some things around the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, things like numbers, mm -hmm. uh, vaccination, the general kind of cautious optimism that, that's <laughs> in the air right now. Uh, what do you got, Julia? Indeed. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's still good to be paying attention to these things, um, even as uh, vaccinations persist. I happen to have my first dose today. Congratulations. Um, it's, thank you so much. I'm most excited I've ever been to have a vaccine. Um, but, you know, I think we all still need to remember that, for example, um, masking is still really important, that we can still kind of spread the virus just by kind of inhaling it into our airways, even if once we are fully vaccinated, we don't get as sick um, or aren't able to spread it as easily. Um, we still need to be taking these precautions to save those around us, you know, those who aren't vaccinated, those who can't ever be vaccinated because of various health issues. So good thing to keep in mind. Um, and also kind of when you look at the data, um, you can see that, you know, this is still very much in our city, um, even though it's begun trending downward in the last week or so. Um, there's now a total of um, over 5,800 positive cases. We're now at 84 fatalities and deaths are still occurring in our community. Um, our percent positivity does remain below 1%. Which is a really good sign. It means we're we're still keeping up our testing capacity at the very least. So we're staying on top of this virus, um, which is great. Um, I think the other kind of thing to look at, if you scroll down, we have, oh no, right there, we have those vaccinated numbers. So Somerville has started tracking the number of residents who've been vaccinated. Um, so hey, 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 look at that. Look at those thousands, right? Thousands that's, of, of that's residents. Impressive. Yes, and numbers. Look at those. And they're climbing every day. Um, so this is really, really exciting, um, you know, that, you know, day by day, we all get safer as more and more of our neighbors and the people in our communities be, are getting vaccinated against this. Um, so, you know, stay cautious, but, you know, there's a little hope and that's good. That's something to celebrate. Yeah. Um, scrolling down a little, you can see those um, vaccinations kind of represented in graph form and how this is all happening. Um, you can see the races represented here as well. So, look at those different numbers. So we can see that broken down. The city can continues to kind of break down the data in a lot of helpful ways. And this, if we continue scrolling down, I'm sure our viewers will recognize the data we've been looking at pretty much every time we do one of these things, um, right. those graphs and all of that. Um, so all of this is still really helpful. It's still kind of looking at the demographic breakdown. One, um, thing, one thing that I did point out when we were, when we were discussing it um, is that last roundup that we had, things uh, that up arrow, meaning that things are continuing, infections are continuing in an upward trend, which yep. is just happening nationwide and especially statewide. Um, you know, we're actually seeing some down arrows here, which is, you know, room again for cautious optimism. Yes. And there's a number, I mean, we are kind of, we've had a little bit of good weather. Um, so, you know, there's, it's a little easier to socialize outside, which is really great. Um, that's another thing right there that you're at that I always love calling attention to that we should continue to keep in mind that this is not imp impacting all of us equally, um, that there are certain neighborhoods, especially um, low income neighborhoods, um, public housing, um, communities of color that have been harder hit by this virus. And when you look at this heat map and compare it to those environmental justice populations, you can see that there is some clear specific overlap there um, on those two maps. So a really important thing to keep in mind as we all kind of get through this together, you know, as a community, as a city. Yeah. Um, so Somerville data continues to be a really good resource. Um, as far as other things go, um, kind of on the COVID front, um, there's been a little bit of like opening up, a little bit of business opening up. Um, the Somerville Licensing Commission in the city has been talking about different kinds of live performance that can be happening at the moment. So singing is, and uh, I think wind instruments is still uh, restricted um, because, you know, naturally of kind of the kind of, you know, aerosol spray that can occur. Um, initially the licensing commission had approved, you know, like circus arts and acoustic performance, like guitar and, um, you know, stringed instruments and all things like that. And recently they did expand it a little bit um, to include some theater, comedy, spoken word, um, things that you, you know, can do with a mask. Um, but, you know, if you're kind of amplified, that can work well. Um, 
they're also kind of going to start working with uh, gyms to, you know, plan on safely reopening. Um, flea markets are allowed to kind of apply for permits again. So it's like kind of starting to open up. So, you know, this is kind of changing day by day. And as we all know, sometimes things change if numbers get worse, um, but hopefully kind of as these vaccinations continue rolling out, um, we'll be able to continue moving through this and kind of starting to reopen our society and our amazing things that make our community such a fun place to live, you know what I mean, again. So that's just another thing that I would draw um, everyone's attention to that, you know, this is beginning, um, have some hope, you know, have some patience. Yeah. Um, and kindness, you know, for, for your city and elected officials who are still navigating this. Um, and yeah, this um, we're, we're in quite a different place than we were this time last year, uh, where events across the board were, were can- in-person events across the board were canceled and people were beginning to look to virtual events for, for everything from yeah. football to art beat to, 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 to everything. And now we're seeing that uh, event planners and city, city organizations and city departments uh, are beginning to plan in-person events, scale down in-person events and still exercising you know, physical distancing. The first example of that is the citywide cleanup on April 24th. I spoke with Yuritsa Menjivar from the Somerville Arts Council. And uh, you know, we, we had talked about how this will be their first their first in-person event that they're organizing. And there's a lot of protocols in place. Um, she did not uh, indicate whether or not this would be, you know, some sort of bellwether for, for future events. Um, again, they have to approach this thing really, really cautiously as you would imagine. But yeah, uh, we're in an, interest, an interesting place, uh, a different one than we were last year. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, just thinking I'm actually, I'm serving on the organizing committee for um, the Welcome Project's YUM event this year. Um, and we are planning a virtual event, but it's it's been really interesting to kind of talk about how they managed that event last year versus this year, because last year we were barely kind of figuring out Zoom and what a virtual event could or should look like. And there were so many restrictions on where we could go and what people were able to do. And, you know, even though this event, because it's kind of food focused, like it still needs to be virtual with kind of like a takeout aspect. We're really excited um, that it's still going to be like a fun and engaging event that we've all learned enough about like what we like, you know, I mean, during COVID and what we can do virtually. Um, and yeah. gosh, yeah, this time last year was bleak. Um, and it's, it's definitely a bit better. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that, that trend continues. Yeah. Uh, moving on to uh, another piece of event that we, uh, another excuse me another piece of news that we just uh, found out about. Uh, unfortunately, there was a a uh, a car crash um, recently uh, that occurred uh, on the McGrath Highway and uh, near McGrath Highway and Broadway. So this is still a, a developing story, and and a, a, an elderly person was injured with life threatening injuries. What else can you share about that, Julia? Sure. Uh, yeah, so there is definitely, there's not much information at this time. You're correct. Um, it was a pedestrian crash that happened on April 13th um, at around 8.49 p.m. in the evening um, involving a 72-year-old man um, and a white um, kind of a Ford vehicle, I believe. Um, it is a hit and run. So this car hit a pedestrian and left the scene, fled the scene um, of the hit and run. And the police are currently searching for that vehicle. Um, the Mass State Police has shared photos of the vehicle. It's apparently a rather um, specific kind of make and model of car. So they're hopeful that they'll be able to find this, this car and um, the person who committed um, this hit and run. Um, at the moment, that's kind of, you know, they're, they're seeking more information. Um, the person who was hit um, is currently in serious condition at Mass General Hospital. Um, he has not, um, thankfully, he has not passed away. Hopefully, he will pull through. Um, the family is devastated, um, understandably. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, unfortunately, you and I both know, um, being involved in kind of Somerville things, that we've had to talk about this issue a number of times um, over the past few years and and before, um, but especially over the past few years. um, And, you know, this stuff um, keeps happening. Yeah. Keeps happening. Um, We know that, you know, pedestrian safety period is an issue in Somerville. We we also know that this area, kind of McGrath, Mystic, um, this area of the city, 
has a higher rate of um, like pedestrian crashes and hit and runs. Um, though there ha- there was also a hit and run that occurred on um, Powderhouse Boulevard um, and a recent pedestrian fatality that occurred off of College Ave. Um, you know, not not quite the busy, busy road that McGrath and Broadway are. Um, but unfortunately, um, I know you you know, wanted to speak about this today and I agree because um, this is this is just one crash, but it is not in a vacuum. I right. think it's kind of what we're all, what we all understand um, that, you know, for example, you know, there's a recent advocacy, advocacy group that just formed around kind of creating safer streets. Um, Somerville talks a lot about vision zero goals. Um, Somerville has a mobility division, you know, dedicated in part to making streets safer and easier to navigate, um, which have, you know, done things like install curb bump outs and, um, you know, um, raised sidewalks and speed bumps and um, all sorts of different traffic calming measures in an effort to slow down drivers in Somerville. Um, in this specific case, I do just want to call out that McGrath is a state road, which does oftentimes tie the hands of the city in terms of the immediate changes that could be made. Um, but it's still in Somerville, you know, it's still impacting residents. Yeah. Yeah. And um a few years back when there was a, a traffic fatality um, near the 93 on-ramp, uh, near the stop and shop on Broadway, uh, it's kind of a uh, pedestrian underpass that connects the stop and shop on Broadway to Assembly Row. Um, and a couple of years ago, there was a fatality there. And I had spoken with uh, Mike Connolly, uh, Representative Mike, Mike Connolly and uh, Jen Atwood from East Somerville Main Streets about you know, what the state was doing uh, to, to get improvement, uh, uh, a higher quality of pedestrian safety uh, in that area, because it, 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 it wasn't the first incident there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I imagine will happen is something similar um, and, and uh, hopefully just a call for, for making the place making that particular intersection uh, more pedestrian friendly. This is in my neighborhood and, um, you know, I bike across the McGrath Highway regularly uh, or regularly enough, I uh, walk across the McGrath Highway. It's it's not pedestrian friendly. <laughs> I mean, there is an overpass, a pedestrian overpass. Um, it's not the most convenient because it's set away from the major intersection. But yeah, yeah, this is, it's, it's a problem. And also just um, kind of the chatter that I've, I've been hearing from uh, cyclists and pedestrians and even drivers about how drivers seem even more distracted now um, with the pandemic. I don't know if the, the pandemic, the lower levels of traffic um, that came, uh, that drivers were experiencing created this sort of expectation now you know, that as traffic increases, that maybe drivers have subconsciously that they're they're not getting where they need to fast enough. And so, uh, you know, they're speeding more, they're distracted more. Um, you know, all, all of this uh, just comes into, uh, you know, it, 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 how, how pedestrian safe, how cyclist safe is Somerville. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's a rite of passage almost that, that uh, it's a grim rite of passage and it's terrible to refer to it this way, but it almost seems like it that we have a pedestrian or a cyclist, um, terrible, ac- uh, not accident, terrible crash like this uh, or, e- or one that results in a fatality. And we see it year after year after year, um, you know, and, and you know, it, it's up to us uh, residents uh, to make sure that we stay on top of our city le- and state leadership to to constantly improve this. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, you know, about kind of speed increasing after COVID. I have to say, you know, just, you know, I'm a North Cambridge resident and live outside of Davis Square. And I'd say that that's definitely true, that people have just, just become accustomed to kind of navigating these streets much faster um, than anyone really expected to, because it's such a dense city, you know, so who knows, you mean, I'm sure we have professionals <laughs> kind of looking at this and thinking about why this is happening. Um, but gosh, like, hopefully, 
hopefully we can do something to mitigate that because that's a tough, that's a very kind of personal, that's a behavior change in a way um, and hard for, you know, cities and towns necessarily to directly influence. Um, but we'll have to see. I mean, you know, hopefully there'll be some at least kind of temporary mitigation measures put at some of these high risk intersections, um, whether it's like cones or flex posts or, you know, who knows, you know, what um, would work. But yeah, it's devastating. It's devastating to see this happen over and over again. Um, and I, you know, I know, I know, you know, no one wants to lose a community member. Of course, it's it's hard for everyone. Um, I hope I hope something can be done. You know, again. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, moving on to to other news. Um, maybe we could get all this, all, everything else, into a neat neat little uh, <laughs> uh, capsule here. Um, sure. I know you want to go over uh, the recent tear gas ban. Um, uh, a native plant ordinance and then some uh, justice for Flavia letters. Um, yeah. We'll so try to hit each of those. Okay. Yeah. The ordinances. So Somerville has recently um, approved two new ordinances, which are kind of cool. So I can talk about those in tandem. Um, the first was a native plants ordinance. Um, this was the result of years of work. I think about three years of work on the part of um, Ward 7 Councilor Katiana Ballantyne working with um, advocates at Green and Open Somerville to ensure that Somerville is planting native plant species on city owned land. Um, so this is important for a number of reasons. I am certainly no expert, learned a lot um, in reporting on this, but basically um, the, this ordinance now requires that 100% um, native plants are planted along rivers um, and the community path and the Green Line extension. 75% um, uh, native species need to be in parks and 50% of plants um, along streets need to be native trees. Um, so it means, you know, that a lot, there are going to be just be a lot more native species being planted in our cities, which is, you know, good, which I kind of makes sense when you think of like native species, it supports our native ecosystem, you know, it helps the birds and the bugs and the creatures that live here um, in our little New England bubble, um, you know, have what they need, have the nutrients they need, have, you know, it supports kind of just everything happening in that in the right way in the right cycle. Um, so this is, you know, a pretty um, historic ordinance and the advocates were, you know, really excited. I think a lot of them wanted to see it, you know, go even for even further. Um, but they were definitely, you know, happy about where it ended. Um, one of the organizers, Renee Scott, who is the co-founder of Green and Open Somerville, um, said that, you know, I think she said, you know, plants are the foundation of the food web, right? And without them, the insects that rely on them for their own survival and life as we know it would disappear. So this ordinance, while it's kind of just supporting our kind of Somerville and our like New, New England environment, it also plays a part in, you know, climate and environment change and just kind of supporting, um, you know, all having all the right things going on at the right levels. And um, I think, you know, for example, Tori Antonino, another founder of Green Open Somerville, um, noted that there's like 3 billion fewer birds in North America today than there were in 1970. This ordinance is going to help support them. So it's this kind of thing that, you know, is it seems like small, like just the plants, like why can't we just plant native plants? Um, but having it kind of codified in this way means a really good thing for, you know, for our neighborhoods and for the environments and all the little birds. So that's one cool thing that the right. city council has been up to with the support of advocates. Um, another uh, recent thing has been an ordinance banning tear gas and regulating chemical and kinetic weapons as well as pepper spray. Um, so this was, I think, you know, a lot of people were interested in this as this has to do with policing. Um, so there's a lot of attention on this. And this ordinance, which was kind of um, brought forward by Ward 3 Councilor Ben Ewan Campen um, and developed in kind of partnership with other councillors as well, well as um, I think the National Lawyers Guild um, of Massachusetts and others, um, goes far to kind of just really regulate the use of these weapons in Somerville. Um, it's important to note that Somerville police do not have or stock tear gas, chemical or kinetic weapons. They do have pepper spray. Um, so this ordinance covers all of them. Um, so it kind of was an effort to restrict and regulate the use by Somerville police, but also to restrict and regulate the use by any law enforcement officer kind of working in the city of Somerville. So if there's a mutual aid call, if a Medford officer is arresting someone on city ground, um, 
that part of the ordinance is a little bit up to like legal challenge, um, which they wrote into it that like to the extent available by law, this applies to other law enforcement officers as well. Um, but what this does, so it bans tear gas outright. Um, it classifies chemical crowd control agents and kinetic impact projectiles like rubber bullets as last resort weapons that can only be used if all other methods of de-escalation have been unsuccessful and then clearly defines the circumstances in which they can be used. So, for example, like when warnings have to be issued, who they have to be issued to, how, like in what way, um, and also limiting like the person who can make the call on their deployment to captains, shift commanders, or like a higher ranking officer. Um, and then it also bans, it regulates the use of pepper spray. So it kind of like bans the use of pepper spray with exceptions, um, which is that, you know, an emergency exists requiring the immediate use of pepper spray um, to prevent serious bodily injury or death. Um, an officer witnesses ongoing illegal property destruction um, or is unable to detain someone with a low, lower level of force, um, but always has to give a clear verbal warning um, before use and allow a reasonable amount of time for that person to comply. Um, so a lot of this stuff has kind of already been out there in terms of language, but this move was kind of to just, again, codify it in law, express the kind of intent and support of the city council to regulate these materials. Um, and there was a couple kind of catalysts for this. One is very, very public. You know, everyone saw the protests that happened nationwide. Somerville itself did not have a protest in which officers deployed any of these weapons. Um, but we saw the photos. We all know that this was happening across the country and in Boston. Um, so, but pepper spray as well, there was um, a kind of less kind of high scale incident of a now retired Somerville officer um, pepper spraying a person in custody who was not resisting arrest, who is now being prosecuted by the Middlesex DA. Um, we have also reported on that. And during kind of conversation about this ordinance and committee, um, they spoke about that also being an intent to just ensure that officers know that like this is how pepper spray should be used. They still wrote in that, you know, it says, like, you know, an exception is an emergency exists requiring immediate use, which is a pretty broad kind of stipulation. Um, but still, I think, again, the hope is to just kind of clarify what the officers want. It's also notable that um, that pepper spray point of the ordinance is the issue that was most resisted by the city and by um, the police department. That's where they felt it wasn't, they weren't sure um, whether this was appropriate because regulations already exist around pepper spray. Um, so they were like, you know, we don't want to have officers have two different sets of standards. And the counselor's point was, well, in Somerville, we have a higher standard. So we, we want this here. Um, so feel free to read more about that. Um, as far as, do I have time for the last thing? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, the last thing I'll touch on um, is a recent development um, with kind of a not so recent context. So um, some of the residents may have seen uh, the Boston Globe article or the Good Morning America coverage of Flavia Perea, um, whose son um, in 2019 had the police notified when there was an incident at school of another girl reporting that he had touched my bum. Um, and according to Flavia, this, um, the police were notified, which is a completely inappropriate according to her completely inappropriate like action after this and that that was kind of a an age appropriate thing that had happened um and her son ended up um, being kind of um in the books as accused of sexual assault and at the time he was six years old so this is a very controversial issue there are sides to it um, at this point the city has not come out and said anything. Um, according to kind of everyone I've spoken to on the issue, this has to do with the fact that it is really controlled by legal, that there are some lawsuits that may either are involved or will become um, involved. And so what people can say kind of on the record in terms of responding to this is severely limited. Um, however, residents are now banding behind her um, and this cause. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is because um, on Monday, on April 12th, um, a small group of residents representing a much larger group of residents delivered a letter by hand to City Hall, um, to the mayor, calling for an acknowledgement of what is going on, as well as asking for uh, several specific um, kind of actions or demands that they want to see. 
Um, one is that, you know, ensure that the local police record for Perea's son is expunged, um, acknowledge the harm done to Perea's family, um, remove police from schools and replace them with counselors. This has also been a request of the defund SPD group. Right. Um, fully fund a restorative justice program, um, institute annual district-wide anti-racism and implicit bias training, and finally to fund an independent equity audit of the schools and the city. Um, so these are, they're all calling for these things. Um, it was a relatively small group, like I said, of about like a dozen to 16 people. Um, they were representing a larger group of about 50 that are regularly meeting, calling themselves Justice for Flavia. Um, and the letters, uh, the letter to Mayor Crittatoni was signed by over 300 residents. I believe there's also a, a very similar letter to the school committee, which was signed by, or I think around 400 residents. Um, so I just bring this up because um, you know this this is an ongoing issue in the community, um, and while the city at this time has not responded to it in in many ways, that they've provided some kind of legal um, kind of responses and comments on the record. Um, there's I think a lot of residents want to know you know what what happened and are now kind of bending behind her and saying yes, like we we want to know what happened. There are also I think. Um, some parents who are starting to come out and say, hi, like this happened with my kid and I didn't get this reaction. And um, what I should have mentioned long before and what I'm going to mention now is that Flavia, uh, Flavia is a woman of color and her husband is a black man and her son is um, black. You know, he's a you know, mixed race child as well. So it's important to note that race absolutely um, plays a role here. Um, so this is kind of a fight that she um, has been fighting alone <laughs> when I spoke to her at this gathering on Monday. And she she was really emotional um, kind of seeing the support from the community. Um, so I, again, I bring this up just to kind of let residents know that this is something that residents are organizing around at the moment. Um, so if this is something you're interested in learning more about, I do have an article up about that um, on our website. And I'm sure, you know, if you kind of do some searching and connecting there, are, a lot of parents are kind of um, organizing around this. So anyways, it's a tough issue. I know yeah. there are you know, a lot of sides, um, but something good to be educated about. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we will be tracking development of that story. Um, and then, yes, just holding Somerville to a higher standard uh, seems to, uh, you, you want it to apply in a case like that. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me, Julia. Just so much, as usual, to go over. Uh, not a whole lot of time to go <laughs> to, to go over it with you. Uh, but if any of our viewers are interested in learning more, you can read articles about everything that we've talked about at uh, somerville.wickedlocal.com. That'll take you to the Somerville Journal's website. You can read Julia's articles. You can read other reporters' articles. You get yourself informed, which is what we need right now. <laughs> um, Thank you, Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Always a pleasure. I really enjoy our, our news roundups. Me too. And uh, I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center. Uh, everybody stay safe out there. Uh, vaccinations expands to uh, the general population 16 and over on April 19th. So get yourself vaccinated. <laughs>